To me, Dead Ops Arcade is a great game, though a lot of Call of Duty players would be quick to dismiss it as not being a real zombie map or whatever. Admittedly, the gameplay for someone like myself who's been playing at a high level for, what is it, 8 years now? It does become a bit repetitive after a while. You don't play a 40 hour DOA game just for the heck of it. At the end of the day, it's all about the competition, trying to be the best among your peers. And whenever you achieve a new personal best, or if you're lucky enough, a world record on the game, <laughs> Boy, is that more satisfying than any arbitrary in-game reward. When you look back at the original Dead Ops Arcade that came out on Black Ops 1, uh, I think my initial reaction was about the same as everybody else's. All these games like uh, Call of Duty, they're, they're these traditional first-person shooters, and then you get a, a bonus game Easter egg in there like Dead Ops Arcade. And you look at it, you play it, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, hey, <laughs> what what the heck is this? At first, I was just like, bro, why are we even playing this? <laughs> like, let's go play some actual zombies. I had a friend in school who I used to play Black Ops 1 zombies with, and we tried to get high rounds on every map. And then one day, we wanted to play Dead Ops, and I was kind of like, are you serious? Not, nobody plays Dead Ops. We played it and we got the like 30 something and I thought it was so good because I, I had never heard of like high rounds on dead ops before. Like back then I wasn't allowed to play video games during the school week. And so every weekend when I got home <laughs> for probably a year, I would just, as soon as I got home, I would just play dead ops arcade for like the entire weekend. I used to play like one game a day or like one game a week for like just fun, see how far I can go. Uh, when I first started playing it, I didn't really like it. I found it too frustrating, I died all the time, I was just like the usual random. But for some reason I decided I'll have a go at it, I'll give it a chance. I guess the best way to really describe DOA is just one big shit show. It's, it's a top-down shooter where you're controlling a guy in a small room and you're going around collecting guns, power-ups, you know, you're shooting down enemies. Uh, trying to collect prizes and stuff and just trying to rack up a high score. And you go through these challenges in which you fight off hordes of zombies. It's just basically an adventure, really. And you, you discover all these new rooms and challenge rounds and you get introduced to these new zombie characters. Very simple arcade gameplay. It's a team-based game, it's a strategy-based game. That off arcade requires so much attention to detail. You know, most of the time I forget to blink when I'm playing Dead Ops because I'm concentrating so hard. There's a lot of hand-eye coordination and muscle memory involved with playing DOA. One slap from a zombie in a crucial situation can make you lose your score multiple player and derail your entire game. In Dead Ops Arcade, you're always trying to look for the, the right way out at all times possible and you always have to have like a very high level of awareness and quick thinking skills to you know get out of a certain predicament that you're placed in. DOA is a twin stick shooter in which enemies relentlessly attack you from all directions. It's like the retro game Smash TV. This kind of reminds me of, uh, of something like Smash TV which is, you know, the old game where uh, you're in a game show studio and you're going around blasting stuff, collecting money and prizes. When did I get the first idea to create Dead Ops Arcade? Well, uh, that happened when I walked into a colleague's office. Uh, my colleague James Snyder was debugging some player vehicle animations and he had a test level that uh, he was using to debug this and he had the camera in a top-down mode. And when I saw it, it sort of reminded me of, of an old arcade game. Growing up in the 80s, it was the golden era of arcades, and I played a lot of top-down twin-stick shooters. And uh, for me, I was always nostalgic about that genre, and it was always something I gravitated towards. And so uh, when I saw this test level, I immediately knew it had some potential uh, given all the zombies and, and lore that Call of Duty brings with it. I knew we could do something really cool. DUA is extremely unforgiving. Only 0.1% of players managed to defeat the first boss battle on co-op. In addition to this, the median round achieved on DUA is only round 13. So well over half the player base doesn't even get to make it to the Room of Fate, where you get to choose from four different abilities which aid you in your quest. In the beginning, we really didn't know how to get them, but you know, once we figured out the, the general pattern, we were able to determine you know what fates were what. You know, there's a pattern, the order of the arrows will determine you know which fate is which. Fortune and fortitude gives you a two times multiplier. If you do die, you retain the two times multiplier. Items last two times as long, so do vehicles. 
for the friendship, you get an, an extra little shooter that kind of pals around with you the whole game. So the firepower perk is basically you get an unlimited death machine. Outside of a few situations, you're consistently the most powerful character. If you're going for higher rounds, you're basically the person who has to be getting all the kills to get all the points. Like, you're basically the character who isn't allowed to die. The Furious Feet is, in my opinion, probably one of the one of the best because it helps you to run faster. I started out playing, like, with my brother. First time we got a, the Silverback defeat, we were like, man, we gotta keep playing, bro. We just gotta keep trying to go farther. And then it wasn't until later on where I think I saw a Telexian video of him defeating the Cosmic Silverback on round 40. And that's, like, whenever it just blew my mind. And I was like, whoa, I actually want to do that. I checked the leaderboards and I saw like in the top three there was Talixian and like a couple other guys I went to their profiles and Talixian actually had a link to a YouTube channel so I'm like all right I'll check it out because like I couldn't get past 20. I, I checked out his YouTube channel and uh funnily enough that's kind of what got me into wanting to make videos on YouTube. A lot of people think Dubs Arcade 1 stops at round 40 but actually after the round 40 Cosmic Silverback boss fight the game continues Every time you beat the silverback, the zombies get faster and a little bit stronger. I think I was like amazed that it just started over. Uh, I thought it was done. I thought it was completed. So basically you get put back on the island and you go through the same arenas all the way up to the jungle arena. And instead of fighting one monkey, you fight against two monkeys. And it, the same process continues after round 80. During the early days of Black Ops, it took a lot longer for players to adapt to the game and develop strategies on DOA since it was such a novel game mode at the time that nobody could have anticipated. 2011, in the summertime, that's whenever the DOA population was just thriving. There were so many people that were constantly in games, and there was so much to learn about the game, and a lot of mystery surrounding it. There wasn't Twitch live streams being named every single day and stuff. And for me, it's always been more about, you know, the team play, not the solo gameplay. I mean, it's just more uh, camaraderie when you have friends playing alongside you. You know, my favorite part about co-op DOA, man, is honestly just, I, I mean, I used to play with this one guy. I, I'm still friends with him actually today. We both uh, played. We we're both the same age, same state. We actually met up uh, in real life a couple times. There were zombies. There, there was arcade mechanics. And for me, it was the, a combination of uh, two of the best world. It's my, by far, uh, favorite mode. The Easter egg sort of happened in the wee hours of the night, and we kind of just grab stuff off the shelf from things that were already created in the main game itself. Most of the studio had no idea that this thing was being developed, and even to this day, it would not be hard to find people inside of Treyarch that have no idea what, what Dead Ops is or, or how they could access it. For me, the value of Dead Ops Arcade really lies in, in the fact of its simplicity. It's a game that you can improve upon almost indefinitely. Uh, the, well, the most appealing factor to DOA for me was probably just the core gameplay. So for me, a lot of DOA was more about the fun aspect than the getting records. I was at a stage in my life where I just wanted to play video games. Like, I didn't think I was ready to be more social and to engage myself in, in the larger community. So I found a lot more solace in, you know, in an online community. I connected really well with a lot of specific players that just happened to be playing Dead Ops Arcade. A lot of these players became some of my best friends, even, you know, in some of the friendships I made while playing dead ops specifically i had grown a lot as a person i just loved it like to me it was like the ultimate video game like you had to be really good to play it the aspect of the game that appealed to me the most was definitely the skill factor because unlike regular zombies you actually need to be good to play dead ops arcade I found it more interesting than, than the regular zombies because there's a lot more finesse to managing to survive in it. Like in the regular maps, you kind of just run in a circle for endless hours. For DOA, you have to react a lot more to the situations on the map. Any other zombies map is pretty much, it's going to max out in difficulty past like pretty much round 50. I think what I enjoyed the most within Zombie when I, I began to play it was the survival aspect. By that, I, I mean, it, it was really 
hard to go to round 25 on a Nacht der Untoten, but uh, with Black Ops 2, Black Ops 3, it was easier and easier to do like a hundred round. And there wasn't really any challenge left. I played my fair share of zombies in the past and I've had a lot of fun on it too. But what really sets the UA apart for me is how each round is unique from the previous and becomes progressively more difficult. In the first person maps, the speed of the zombies caps off relatively quickly. And since most wonder weapons and traps don't become any less effective in the later rounds, the health increase for the zombies becomes inconsequential. But on the UA, the health increase every round has very real implications, since you're forced to use the weapons that are given to you. And I think it comes as no surprise that someone like Frenzy was able to smoothly transition from being a top dead ops player to a multiple time world record holder on some of the other zombie maps as well. D frenzy is D frenzy. I mean, he was the DOA god. Back then, I was what? I mean, 10, 11 years old when I started playing. He's definitely, you know, someone I looked up to. Frenzy was like the cool guy, quote unquote, right? Who has all the videos on YouTube and back in the day, that's the guy you want to be like. Like, you want to be on YouTube, you want to, you know, set world records and such. We never got to play because he was in the US and I was in the UK, but he told me to look at his uh, highest round on YouTube, so I did. That's when he had like 3,000 subscribers. It was, I think it was 300 subscribers. Frenzy always had a passion for being very good at, at whatever games he played and that carried over from DOA eventually over to regular zombies where he became one of the most accomplished high round zombies player and started streaming on Twitch and gained a huge following which also popularized DOA in a bit. He was what you would call an anti-hero. He, like he was like the Deadpool of DOA. I would always watch his videos, I would always see how he did things and I kind of tried to copy the master himself. Frenzy was uh, quite the player I would say and probably like the face of the DOA for a while. He was probably one of the people that a lot of people either aided or they loved him. I feel like a lot of people didn't really like the approach that I had, even though I think that they did like playing with me at the time. But later on, like a week later in the party chat, it'd be like, oh yeah, like <laughs> that guy, like he's such an asshole or something like that. The first notable recorded video I put up solo wise was the 96 solo game over. It was a tied record with Frenzy at the time. So that kind of boosted my reputation a little bit on ps3 community because people were looking at frenzy to be this the doa god of sorts we've had our bouts too as well and you know, our disagreements things like that the frenzy he's a really good uh zombies player one of the biggest trolls as well but he's a cool guy i know he kept continuing to to play dead ops long after me and just keep grinding out zombies initially frenzy was a big troll where he would uh enter lobbies and just talk smack and then leave but eventually he turned out okay <laughs> he made a, a fake psn account or my or my login to play dead ops over there and uh make me look bad from what he told me he just played really shitty so everybody would think i sucked <laughs> Yeah, Monk Shadows is like a really, really good player. And he was one of my favorite teammates, but he stopped playing like after the summertime in 2011. I think he was honestly, I'd say like a top three player like on Xbox at the time. We even carried one of my friends from Halo that had never even played Dead Ops Arcade before. And we got him to rank number five on the leaderboards at round 99. Oh yeah, that was that was kind of a trolly thing that we did, especially on D Frenzy's part. So we literally grabbed just, I don't even know, whose friend it was, but he had never played uh, Dead Ops Arcade before and we just slapped him in a game with us and carried him to 99. He's up there on the leaderboards and he still doesn't know how to play. There was a big race to 99 towards the beginning of Xbox and PlayStation. The leaderboards didn't register past that and for a team like myself and Genetics, we found that round 99 was a good stopping point because you could usually play it in one sitting. But after a while, 99 just wasn't enough. So some players decided, okay, how about we try to go past this round and push the game to its limits. We are the first in the world to reach round 100. This is just video proof to say that we fucking killed it. I was surprised to see uh, a community emerge around the game. At first it was a few YouTube videos that would show up, a couple of people sending me some tweets telling me what round they got to, and I was suitably impressed. I mean, these guys were reaching round 90, round 100. I was just happy the game was still 
fun and playable at that high level. My first round 120 game, I ended up playing it with Fritz and Loke in like October, I think, of 2011. And at the time, the, the previous world record was like round 103 by me and Justin Time. Uh, we were only starting it up to try to get Fritz's first round 99 on the leaderboards. Anyways, we end up getting to like round 94 and Fritz starts having this idea of, I don't care about the leaderboards, let's just keep going. I want to see how far this goes or how far we can get. So after we were the first people to get to round 120, me, Loke, and Fritz, even though Fritz wasn't really there towards the very end, we decided that we wanted to go for higher. We wanted to go for 136. I had this ridiculous thought that playing without the furious feet would actually be the optimal strategy. We ended up crushing 120, but we got pretty lucky. It honestly kind of felt like an empty 120 complete. Because what happened was the first monkey spawned in and immediately suicided outside of the map. From that point on, the game just went from like being pretty hard to just like the hardest game I've ever played in my life. I just remember telling Fritz, hey man, I've got like no equipment. You need to suicide at the beginning of this round so that I can get equipment. And he's like, uh, yeah, well, I'm just going to wait until a vehicle spawns so that I would be guaranteed nukes or, or boost or whatever. And I'm like, no, bro, like you just need to do it now. Can't protect myself from like these dogs. And oh, what do you know? Like the guy got greedy and <laughs> I ended up dying because of a dog. At that point, it was kind of uncharted territory. I probably should have listened to him and maybe we would have beat that round. My 120 complete game with Frenzy and Rambo was definitely one of the more memorable games that I played in DOA. I was host of the game, I had host feet, Frenzy was Yellow Gun, and Rambo was Green Fortune. Anyways, we woke up really early, we started right away, and we played for like 20 hours straight or so, something stupid. We were also the second team on Xbox to beat the 120 boss. Yeah, that 120 game. I, I started having, I guess, borderline memory loss that game because I was just so exhausted. I would constantly forget who was actually playing with me. So it, I would have to pull up the scoreboard and tell myself, oh, okay, that's, that's my friend Derek running in the middle of the map with the red player. We ended up running into a bug in the game known as the Invisible Monkey, which basically derails your game completely unless you take drastic measures to counter it. Uh, we got Invisible Monkeys and we ended up having a glitch and we're not, we weren't actually 100% sure if we would have beat 120 if we didn't glitch, really. I mean, we tried, we tried to keep it fair and go with around what we thought we would have had, like in terms of equipment and lives, but we really don't know. I guess if this occurs whenever a silverback on the boss round ends up getting killed while he's boosting or jetpacking in the air. So basically, if you killed the monkey while it was boosting, the game would register that the monkey was still boosting. So the game thought he was still in that animation, and that animation there stuck throughout um, the entire time, only on the jungle map. Corner, right? right. It's oh, right over here. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's right on this map. I'll wait till they're finished. We they're got flying. it. Fuck, we man. It. Yeah, we got it, dude. Somehow the game just freezes uh, the monkey and it's just always a hitbox. I just remember the first time that it happened to me. I couldn't believe my eyes. Like, I thought I was delusional for a second. I ended up dying uh, a couple times. I uploaded a video of it and I looked back at the video after I uploaded it and I'm like, wait a minute. I did die by nothing. Like, the, like I literally was dying by invisible zombies or later on called the invisible monkey. So basically the only way to get through is to try and sit on top of the rocket. I actually had the invisible monkey glitch and since I didn't really know how to get on top of the rocket or even what to do in that scenario, it, it screwed me over heavily. But the most annoying part about the whole invisible monkey situation was nobody really knew how to prevent it or what it was caused by for a long time like a good year so the invisible zombie discovery by sneasel and i was it was definitely interesting process <laughs> everyone knew about this invisible zombie thing and we just always assumed it just had to do with i don't know really know what we actually assumed i guess it was just we thought there was just some kind of bug in the game it was definitely a huge discovery for high round players there were a lot of talented players on DOA who could have done some really amazing things, but a lot of them just stopped playing after a year or two and moved on to other games. You know, you had players like Von Sanowski, Justin Time, The Man 434. The Man, probably, uh, well, 
out of fashion these days. Uh, apparently, the furthest he ever made it was like 154 or something with Raji, apparently. There's no video proof, so that's just from hearsay. I would just hear like the most ridiculous stories involving this guy and about how he would just carry people and he would go to around 90 flawless and stuff. And this is all in like, again, 2011, whenever this stuff was just not even heard of. And I'm like, okay, well, I mean, it's obvious. Like we found Jesus, like <laughs> here he is. He's, he's reincarnated. Round 88 is complete. 73.6 million, all that is man. So I play a three player game with him just to kind of see what he's got. Like, you know, maybe this guy really is as good as people say, like everybody's saying this. And I play with him and I felt so underwhelmed. But we get to round 80 and he's playing with the Furious Feet. He only has like five lives and like eight nukes and he was never at 999 the entire game. But I do remember like a cool time when uh, we were playing uh, a game he was host with the gun, which happened a lot way back then. We ended up dying that game on round 96 and at the time like nobody on the ps3 leaderboards add 99 i think what i found kind of funny was right after that game like he said oh so you want to go again i, I was just like N no i, I don't want to just <laughs> start another game right now i think ultimately he ended up in college is what put him off from the game and he kind of disappeared in a way so the 160 game we played which was the ultimate world record which is the, the highest round that you can get in that off arcade it was actually a very very fun game to play we decide you know what let's just put the four best ps3 players in the same game and just see what we can do we had the man four three four and then we had loke who was pretty much just a firepower only one trick player and then we had fritz he was pretty smart and he was pretty reliable and then we had me so we had a very like stacked crew going into that game anyways we get to like round 92 and i swear to this day think that the man pulled the plug in that game because whenever he lagged out he started spinning around in circles and then he just lagged out like a second later <laughs> out of nowhere it's almost like he pulled the plug and i swear it seemed like he did but yeah we were we were always holding on by a thread i i remember when we finally got to the monkey round that we just couldn't even see what was going on we're running around and the monkeys are flying up and down so much and there's so much chaos that i couldn't even find my player let alone try to stay away from the monkeys and the zombies or anything running around i remember when fritz and Loke and frenzy went to 160. It's really a phenomenal achievement and those three players were like the top of the top to me and i just thought oh my gosh it would be cool to play with those guys all that experience and all that skill that we had pretty much acquired and all that knowledge that we had really just showed by the time we get to 160 there's four monkeys and each monkey will have more gems than you know the monkeys at 120 or the monkeys at 80 and even the one at 40. Dead Ops Arcade 1 would pretty much max out at round 160 because that, that's just the game would error every time. But G-Spawn and DOA primarily happens when there is an excess of gems that fly out of the Cosmic Silverback, uh, particularly on round 120 and eventually no matter what on 160. When you kill the monkeys, so many gems fly out that Xbox can't handle it and it uh, just crashes. Oh my God. No, this is, this is not the way. It was supposed to fucking end. Damn it. The game itself is just mechanically not capable of supporting the level that you're at. The error that you get is basically a result of, you know, having gone to a point in the game where you're really not meant to go. There's nothing saying congratulations or the end. The creator DUA didn't design the game with a certain final level in mind. In fact, he didn't know when the game would crash. I knew that players were going to uh, be able to beat the game. I, I, I kind of went into that knowing that. And in the, in the 80s, the classic response to this was to just loop the game back around on itself. So I built that into the design uh, from the get-go. Um, I had no idea how far people could actually go. But yeah, I was definitely surprised uh, to hear uh, about a community of diehard fans and really encouraged uh, about it because that's, you know, I put a lot of effort, James put a lot of effort into the game mode and it was really great to hear that uh, people out there uh, were that competitive with the game mode.
I honestly kind of like that, the fact that there's a limiter to it. And honestly, like, the, the game kind of just needs to be over because at that point, people are going to start having to play, like, one hour long rounds. It's not even going to really be, like, a skill-based thing. Sort of like how Zombies is, even to this day, where it's not even really a skill-based thing. It's just like, oh, hey, guess what? I could just stay connected longer than you can. And so you have to be very careful and make sure you kill one monkey, pick up all the gems real quick, wait a little bit just to be sure. Even though you try to prevent it as much as possible, sometimes you just G-spawn anyways. Like, the game just doesn't give a shit about you. I G-spawn, I think, like, four times on 120. <laughs> many, many times have I encountered the G-spawn error. If I had to give a rough guess, I would say somewhere between 25 to 30 times. There's been one guy named Benji who actually killed, I believe it was three monkeys without a G-spawn, which is extremely hard and rare. So he was the closest to ever actually legitimately get through 160 without the air. One thing that I have wondered about a lot over the years is, is the is the Benji game. I still to this day think that there was a high chance that he could have passed it. That to me goes down as one of the biggest mysteries. Much like baseball is said to be a game of inches, DOA is a game of time, of seconds, right? If that fourth monkey decides to kill itself two or three seconds later, Benji may have been the only player to ever beat 160, <laughs> a record he might have held for eternity. It's certainly possible he would have g-spawned anyways, but I guess that's something we'll never know for certain. I cannot tell you how many times me or or a group of other players that I was playing with lost out on either getting to 160 or getting past 120 sheerly because of the g-spawn error or losing connection or the invisible monkey problem. Yeah, George came like later into the game. Uh, George is obviously a super talented player. He actually came around a bit later. It was already around the time when people were already getting past 120. It wasn't until that time where George really came up and just grinding a lot of hardcore high round games. Um, but he definitely was one of the most accomplished players in terms of 160s and 120s. For me, getting to round 160 was like a dream. And then it just exploded into me getting there several times over. Well, me and George have been playing for about five years together, starting in 2013. At that time, I had accomplished 120, but I had never made it past it, and he had been a 99 player. His big breakout game was whenever he played with me and Fritz, and we got to round 160, and I think we were the second crew to get to 160. He ended up doing a uh, two-player game with Beast, where they had no feet, and still ended up getting the round 160 with him and that's just a couple weeks later as for the 162 player with fortune myself and george on firepower that game just was fluid there were no issues whatsoever until fourth time cow arena just have it struggling a little bit to rebuild there after um crawler arena uh fourth time that certainly was the first game done with that face setup to make it that far. That game really solidified my relationship with Georgia on a personal level as well. That game really just made us the team that, that we are. Oh my god, we played 28 hours in that. Oh my god. Like, we played 28 hours straight. Like, <laughs> I cannot believe we did that. <laughs> George, uh, yeah, I, I like playing with George. He's always a nice guy. He's just really good at the game. George is uh, a great friend and talented player, although we didn't always see eye to eye at first. But we ended up accomplishing some pretty cool records, like Ram 160 without the firepower in the game. But he just kept grinding the game and had like eight different Ram 160 games when it was all said and done, which is twice as many as anybody else. Well, other than myself, which players have been to round 160 with every fate? Well, gee, now that I think about it, I don't think anybody else has. In the end, I honestly kind of feel bad for George. I definitely think that he's one of the best, if not the best, player in DOA, like, ever. It's it's the fact that, like, he started playing in the wrong era. He was a year too late. I feel like him as a player, he really um, was always trying to prove himself, but he didn't, like, really have that many people to prove himself to. While George probably did accomplish the most on the game, I think there is a good argument to be made that his frequent teammate, I, Mr. Beast, was possibly even more skilled. Mr. Beast just seemed really kind of jealous for a long period of time of myself and the man, to the point where he even made a ESN ID called The Frenzy is a Joke or something like that, because he was just mad that in the end he was never actually getting to the high rounds like we were and he was never actually getting the high scores and stuff but sometime in 2013 it all changed if you program the game to play itself 
I'm not so sure that it would be much better than Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast was probably the most polarizing figure in DOA. We both had a total commitment to like what we enjoyed doing. Like we had a commitment to our craft. We played all of the time. Like we really did. Yeah, Mr. Beast, like he was an interesting character. Mr. Beast is sort of another one of those players. You have to throw the word ego in if you're going to talk about this guy. Because yeah, he was just trying to find ways to like one up other players. He was simultaneously my best friend and my greatest competitor. I think George is more prone to trying to one up on me than I am to one up on him. I play DOA for myself. I don't try and compete with other players, although it may seem like it is. I don't. Uh, I don't really try to compete against anybody. I just try and play for my own best records and things like that. <laughs> Mr. Beast, you know, he wasn't my favorite player. You know, I I didn't really like the guy. I mean, he's just a really cocky guy. There was definitely some questions about some of his gameplay and for the fact that he did have mods but we weren't for sure which games he didn't have mods the uh four player 160 with uh cp3 fritz george and myself that game should never have been played <laughs> the setup of this game just i don't know i don't know how i actually ended up playing the game but it was essentially one of the games where I just I felt like I unlocked a new tier of play. Like I'd have to survive rounds on end without dying with using minimal armory and keeping a high multiplier. I felt that not every player was pulling their weight that game. PS3 versus Xbox was definitely a rivalry back in the DOA1 days. There was always a race it felt like or like a competition of who had the better players, who had, you know, who had the higher rounds. There was just always that debate. It, it was it was definitely a, a healthy competition, I would say for the most part. Uh, there was definitely a fair share of banter going back and forth. Basically it became, you know, who's better, the Xbox team or the, the PlayStation team? And uh, it would go back and forth. From my PS3 perspective, the main thing was that the Xbox system was easier to play on. Like the graphics were better and the gameplay was smoother. As I think about it now, that there was a pretty kind of intense back and forth about who had the better players. And to me, I feel like that was a reflection of how people felt about the consoles themselves. DOA was a complete competitive battle. And all it was was trying to be better than everyone else. That's all it was. And people can sit there and say that that's not what it was but that's really what we all played the game for was to just do something great that couldn't be topped. Honestly, I wouldn't even really say that there was much of a rivalry in the first place just because it was sort of a beatdown. Xbox was just clearly had the better talent. Before I got onto PS3 myself, the game was played out so much differently. Feet player was just playing selfishly and these guys like had no sense of strategy on what to do on like certain maps and they just didn't really even know anything about the game really like as far as actually using tactics and strategies but then i started to teach them like oh yeah you guys should camp in the corners on these maps like it makes it a lot easier yeah firepower guy should be there and yeah you want to use the poles too you really want to use the poles like as much as possible this and that it was like i was teaching these like neanderthals how to like start a fire in the summer of 2013 a bunch of us on xbox decided we were gonna have a competition of sorts where we all started a solo game around the same time and we were trying to get as far as possible and at that particular time nobody had been hired in round 142 on solo so there was about 10 pretty skilled players i would say who participated in this gauntlet and almost all of us fell short of the record uh, except for one player cody time warp aka feed and gun Rambo, what round are you on? You're, I know you're like at least two rounds ahead of me. I've been taking mad breaks. <laughs> Cody time warp. Oh my gosh. Not the best player. Not the best personality. What I don't think people understand is that he was always the underdog too. I think people saw him as a little bit of an outsider and a little bit as untrustworthy. I think a lot of people 
painted him with that brush and i think that influenced both the way he acted in the party chats and how other people ended up treating him or i did play a co-op game with him and we're going to take a sleep break i believe on round 88 and he pulled the plug on me because he thought i was going to pull the plug which is, is pretty funny <laughs> it's a pretty funny concept you know i was basically you know more of a spectator when it came to you know feet and gun and beast and you know all the other bigger players and feet and gun and beast they did not like each other you know and I remember, like, uh, man, Feet and Gun, man, he was just getting so butt hurt. Beast is the only person that does anything, like, significant. So, like, if anybody did anything besides him, I would, like, really be like, wow. But Mr. Beast over here spends his, his life on DOA. If I were to have an enemy in the DOA community, it would certainly be Cody Time Warp. This man felt the need to try and belittle the games that I was accomplishing. So I don't have a very high opinion of him or his playstyle. I know he's done 160 solo, but having him try and belittle my games, just that isn't what, uh, you know, the DOA community should be trying to do. They should be trying to get better. His biggest accomplishment was being the first person to get round 160 in solo. And other than that, like, he really had nothing to show for the amount of time that he played on the game. While Time Warp was approaching 160, Mr. Beast was over on the PS3 and... I guess he also started a solo game because he saw all the attention the competition was getting in the Xbox community, and he wanted to make sure he got to 160, I guess, as well. But allegedly his game froze on round 158. I guess the timing might be a bit of a coincidence. I don't necessarily know if I heard about Xbox doing solos like that, like a solo gauntlet. I kind of just did it on my own. Mr. Beast tried creating this false narrative about Time Warp and tried saying that he was only running them around without actually like killing the zombies. And Mr. Beast at that same time was actually trying to play a solo game as well. And the thing is with his game was he also didn't actually show footage consistently throughout his game. He tried claiming that he got to round 80 flawless in a solo game, which again might be another false narrative that he made up just to kind of boost his own ego he also might have modded in that game too there's some speculation that he might have modded i don't know if he did considering a week later he literally modded around 200 games so who knows what the hell happened to be honest fritz had showed me a technique uh on how to get past the 160 boss using mods. So I took that and I did a solo game because I personally just wanted to play the fifth time around. But it definitely just looked like he was just trying to completely shit on my game. But I don't know if he did it legit. The thing is, it's like it's like the gym. It's like steroids. Once you tell people that you do steroids, nothing else matters. And once Beast told us that he used mods, nothing else mattered. You can't take anything he does to heart. But, uh, I'm gonna keep deleting your comments. Nobody wants to see him nobody cares you're just a hater that's your problem not mine find something better to do with your time than fucking doa and hating and after that time warp made enemies with people on ps3 and at the same time he didn't have too many friends on the xbox either he was never able to really acquire the humility and the, the strong will that it takes to be as great as he could have been, I think. He even recognizes it himself. I, I talked to him last year. He recognizes, yeah, like I really wasted my time. And yeah, like he, he really regrets like having the attitude that he did towards like a lot of players and stuff because he didn't really have the cleanest of reputations. I completely and utterly regret having an attitude towards any of the DOA players because we're supposed to be a community. We're supposed to get things done. Though all of us were so competitive, like, you know, George thought, I know George thought he was the best. It's just that it, you could just tell by the way he spoke. <laughs> Unfortunately, me being younger back then and not as conscious, I guess, as I am now, we used to argue a lot and his 160 60 solo game was you know it was scrutinized but it was it was a really good achievement you know i look back on that and wished it would have gone differently what surprises me is how small the community is and how little people want to cooperate together within the community it's, it's kind of this really weird blacklist competition if you will it's like <laughs> it's really interesting to see how uh, a game like doa can become so competitive um, I mean, after all, it is just an arcade game. Experienced players only play with other experienced players. It seems to be what typically goes on in the community with me. I'll, I'll talk to some people and they'll want to quote unquote set up a big game. It never ends up happening. There's basically different tiers of players because uh, that's how small the community was. It's 
you know, all the good players, you know, you had Rambo, Frenzy, you know, QP Derek, the DOA Cafe, I guess you could say, man. A guy like me, who's always been on the outside, if you will, a little bit, um, you know, we're all big fans of the DOA uh, Cafe, even though we don't know very much about it. I guess that you can't bring up DUA Cafe without actually first like explaining Katie Merker. He's actually the one that coined the term DUA Cafe like without actually realizing it. Yeah, that Katie Merker guy was a borderline psycho. He had just finished a game where he lagged out on round 90 something, falling a few rounds short of his round 99 goal, and he was legitimately convinced that the DUA elite paid off his teammate to pull the plug and sabotage him. The dude one day just decides like that he's gonna like kind of snap back thing and he said oh yeah well I don't know what like you Rambo and Derek do in your little cafe every time you guys are in a party chat. We kind of ran with the term the DOA cafe and we just started putting cafe in our clan tags and trolling around like that. Uh, the cafe was really just an inside joke and abstract concept I guess which could be used to describe top players. A bunch of people just started acting as if they were part of the cafe and they don't even understand like what the whole DOA cafe even is. Well, eventually after doing so many fate games, there really wasn't too much left to accomplish in the game. So no fate was the only way to go further. And it was really more Blade's idea. The most memorable game that we had uh, played had to be the no fate game for me. That just it was uh, the first of its kind. And it was a real test of our skill. And in terms of how the journey goes, it was a rough, rough patch for quite a while of getting to 120 multiple times, failing and, and so forth. Beast and George had failed on 120 quite a few times. And I figured, all right, let me get involved and help them. Because they were struggling to find a reliable third player who could hold their own weight. And after playing with him, I quickly realized that Beast was like a ticking time bomb and I was around for the boom. <laughs> In DOA games, sometimes uh, little incidents or accidents occur. And there's one in which um, Rambo had accidentally run me over with a tank in a no fate game on round 96. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, my God. He ran me over with a tank in which triggered me mentally and I went completely unstable. The next vehicle that spawned, I deliberately ran him into a pole uh, as payback. So there might be some hard feelings still. After he killed me, my blood was boiling. I nearly quit right then and there. Well, it didn't matter because he ended up quitting a few rounds later because he completely lost his marbles and couldn't recover. So uh, we didn't talk for a good three years after that happened. And it's a shame because we were really playing well up to that point. But uh, if he and George wanted to beat 120 on, uh, with no fates, it was going to have to be with someone else. The best game that was played was with Frenzy and George uh, and myself. We were playing at the next level. George and Mr. Beast were trying to get me to play No Fate with them for the longest time, and I don't think that it was until I saw Rambo play with them where I'm like, hey, actually, that, that actually doesn't look too bad. I, I kind of want to give that a try. We end up playing, and we just absolutely crush the game. Like, we're 999 the entire game, all the way up until 120, and then we crush the 120 boss fight, beat it easily, and then we get all the way to 138 and then lag out. And I don't think that any lives were stolen until... I don't think that any lives were stolen at all, like the entire game, yeah. No, no lives were stolen that entire game. Well, I guess even just looking back on it now, that is an accomplishment. Whenever Black Ops 3 was coming out, some people were thinking like, oh yeah, the UA2 might actually happen. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. If it didn't happen in Black Ops 2, it's not going to happen in Black Ops 3. We didn't hear anything really about the possibility of a DOA2 coming back until we finally started hearing about these leaks. And once I heard about these leaks, I'm like, there's no way this could actually be happening. Once we finally saw that the achievement was leaked about the Silverback, we're like, wow, this is really happening. This is crazy. I mean, I was actually surprised they had actually gone through and made it. Like, I didn't expect the DOA 2 for Black Ops 3. I don't know if anybody did. It kind of just came out of nowhere. Like, I heard about it, and I didn't think it was true. And then I saw, like, the little intro cutscene, and I was like, oh my god, this is, this is real. I have to get the game now. I was largely skeptical that a sequel would be worthwhile or that it would even happen. In fact, I actually have a Word document saved where I, for whatever reason, wrote down some predictions a few months before we even knew the game would be happening. And I quote, First, let me make it clear that it is very improbable that they make a DUA 2 or any kind of mode remotely similar to it. Nobody really liked it. It's as simple as that.
for Dead Ops Arcade 2, I was extremely excited. I mean, it was something we had all looked forward to and we'd all had wanted to see for a really long time. When I first started playing it, there was a, an initial excitement and, you know, a newness to it, but yet there was a great similarity. Black Ops 3 came out and I seen DOA 2 when I was on YouTube just scrolling through videos. Uh, and I actually thought the DOA 2 was really hard. I hopped on there. I, I got my ass kicked the very first time I played it. Yeah, so comparing the two, I would say from the difficulty standpoint, the DOA 1 is easier than DOA 2 because of the arena layouts and the luck factor. But if I'm looking at it from a more casual standpoint, I would say DOA 2 is more appealing because of the, the diversity and the spice present in the game, unlike the original. I think that's why many randoms don't play as much because they only can get past like round eight or round nine. It gets too difficult for them. The beginning difficulty curve is too steep. It needs to be a lot easier. 25% of people have only played it because of the bad positioning of where DOA 2 was in the menu screen. Like all the new stuff they added, like it made it more fun, like the first persons created more variety. Yeah, first person mode. Yeah, that was interesting too. There was a power up you could pick up which put yourself into first person mode perspective. And I think that was, it was crucial for the second version. Well, first person mode almost didn't even make it. Uh, it was a last minute addition uh, with about a week before shipping the title. I decided to put a new power up into the game that allow you to go into first person mode. And that came from uh, seeing a PC exploit on DOA 1 that I thought was really cool. The players had somehow managed to get the camera into first person mode and it looked really, really awesome to see uh, that, uh, that game mode in first person. So I thought, what the hell, throw it in there. What could go wrong? But the second version of the game by far outshines and outclasses the first version. Uh, not that there was anything significantly wrong with the first one, uh, but looking at the second game, there's so many great things to say about it. For me, I really didn't play it anywhere near as much. Not because I really didn't enjoy it as much, but I think I had spent the time that I wanted to spend playing Dead Ops Arcade. I felt like I had accomplished what I need, what I wanted to accomplish. I just wasn't into it that much. I didn't really like it as much as Dead Ops 1. In my opinion, I think that the first Dead Ops is better. It's just like, it felt like there was more strategy to it. Like the second one's cool and all, I like the the upgraded face and all that. DOA 2 was a pretty ambitious game when compared to the original. Uh, it had a lot more item pickups, more arenas, a weapon upgrade system, upgraded fates, more enemy types, you name it. So it wasn't too surprising that there were some issues with the game's functionality when it first came out. What? My biggest issue with the game when it first came out was not knowing or not even having a way to tell what fates you're picking up. At a point in time, I think I played 20 games in a row trying to get feet, where unfortunately I got really unlucky all day and couldn't get it. The randomness of the room of fate, not knowing what fate we were gonna get, the non-guaranteed room of judgment. It was annoying to, to try to play to round 38 just to hopefully get the upgrade. So back when the game first came out, Furious Feet, the upgrade for that fate was so broken it would be uh if you had below four boosts every time you died you would go back up the four boosts so if you had zero you'd have four after you died aside from those issues then there was a bunch of gameplay issues such as dying in vehicles i mean the game was still really enjoyable just because there were so many new features and it was still the game stayed true to its doa roots it's really tough to do a sequel to a game like especially to hardcore fans who's going to be picky about everything and then the amount of times where i'd get in a vehicle and like uh just it would put me outside of the vehicle so I'd still be able to be taking damage or being killed inside of a vehicle is also very frustrating. Yeah, it's really tough when you got to deal with the issues as the game progresses through, uh, you know, the different updates and stuff to try and iron some stuff out. The game was a lot of fun, but there was obviously a lot of problems. But thankfully, we had creator Dave King. Not enough good things I can say about David. Yeah, he's uh, really listening to the community. David King's always been uh, been fun to kind of follow on Twitter talks about dead ops are a, a, a little bit occasionally so it's it's kind of fun to to see the developer talk about it and give little secrets or hints what would i say to the fans of dead ops well first of all thank you very much for for playing the mode it we poured our hearts and souls into it and we spent countless hours perfecting it first of all i think it's amazing that uh dave king is willing to work with you know some of the players to solve the issues i know a lot of developers don't do that kind of thing 
So a little bit regarding the guides I've created. Uh, the reason I, I did them in the first place was because back then in 2011, there were some guides out for the game, but they weren't exactly what I would call complete. Uh, the ones in place were either had missing information or completely wrong information. So I felt it was kind of my duty to just kind of give back to the community since I played the game so much. He had asked me to consult on that. So I gave him some information that I had gathered at the time. Uh, so I took my, my knowledge and experience in the professional world as a training developer and I was able to create a, a skeleton of a framework that I was going to use for the guide. I also took my own knowledge and knowledge from other top players in the community and basically we were able to come up with a pretty decent looking guide that's gotten some obviously very good reviews and feedback uh, from not only other top players but also from David King uh, who was you know, the chief technology officer over at Treyarch. Three or four years ago now I don't know the time frame is uh, when I was diagnosed with MS and that's that took a big hit on like me as a person in general. My few games before I was diagnosed, it was getting harder and harder. Like I remember playing a game with George actually. We ended up dying on uh, round 120. Uh, I noticed like the last few games I had played was just really like, I don't know, it's uh, like there was something more wrong like, and that my neurologist actually thought I wasn't going to be able to walk again or do anything. And, like I have really pushed towards bettering myself along with still enjoying games. I can't be as as good at times like there's a lot of varying uh, inconsistencies but like i can still manage pretty well actually his success when he did come back was significant you know i think people a lot of people forgot about him and forgot how good he was doa2 like the early times i did uh, get like a few decent records uh, early on there was a point when i got to i think it was 183 ish or or something like that. There was a game I did play a bit after that. I remember I had a hard time with the mines. There was like there was one time that a mine went off. I managed to get back to like a five times multiplier, and I had a ray gun, and like I didn't feel like I was that close to the mine, but like the mine killed me. And I'm just like my motivation is slowly dwindling away there. Watching someone like him play the game really inspires you to continue to play, get better, you know, hone your, your hone your technique, and uh, it's just really fascinating to watch people of that caliber and uh, watch in amazement at how good they are. During the early stages of DOA2, I definitely grinded a lot <laughs> in terms of going for high rounds, going for world records. And I had some pretty successful games with Rambo, um, with Bluntman as well in there. And I also had a co-op uh, two-player game. That was before the boost actually got patched where you got boost per life, but there was a lot of different changes with the game that made it tougher for when Rambo and I made it to 163 and had one of, we, we had a very intense round 163 where we came super close to, to making it to 164, basically on zero lives, like the entire, the entire round. Yeah, early on in DOA 2, players like Mr. Beast and George weren't really playing, so I kind of took advantage of that and was pretty much able to take any record I set my eyes on. I was part of the first team to ever beat the round 64 boss fight, then I was the first to beat the second boss fight on co-op, and then getting to and beating the third boss fight on round 192 where you face off against three Cyber Silverbacks. You know, I was the first one. No one cares or remembers who was the second to do this. He really took over, got almost all the records there, solo co-op, three player, four player, you name it, throughout most of the beginning part of DOA2 life cycle. Rambo, that guy, I kind of wish maybe I had a chance to play with him at, one, at some point, just so I can talk to him more and, and get more acquainted and see what he's all about. Yeah, there's this one guy in the community, Rambo. Honestly, I kind of think he's a fucking asshole. Like, a lot of things he says about the OA2 players in general, the way that they boost and stuff is just because he's jealous in general about how other people get high rounds and he's too busy with whatever the fuck he has to do. I, I did watch his uh, channel. It's good to show, to see somebody has, uh, you know, a channel just about that ups on YouTube given ideas and uh, facts about the game, uh, also breaking uh, world records in the game. By March 2016, there were quite a few updates made to the game which made it a lot more playable and enjoyable in the higher rounds. So Frenzy and I decided to push the limits of the game and see how far we could really make it. And we kind of got bored, I think, and quit on round 200, which eclipsed the previous record of 171, uh, which was also held by me. Yeah, so me and him, we ended up getting to round 200. We had a pretty decent scores, I guess. It was pretty smooth, and then we ended up losing the record to this guy named 
Cave and this other guy named Voltage. I think they had been trying to beat the co-op record for about like two months and then they finally ended up beating it. It was like right after we got the record too. I remember back when uh, Rambo and Frenzy got round 200 and that was the first round 200 ever in DOA 2 and I saw that and I, I just I really wanted to beat it because I thought it would be nice just one week after they got 200 to just beat their round. As soon as I saw that 200, I was just like, no, this this has to be beat. And sure enough, I did it. I was actually really surprised that the record was beaten so quickly. Uh, I messaged Frenzy immediately afterwards and said, we got to play one more. We ended up playing a 228 game a couple days after they beat us, because they beat us like a week later. And then we beat them like a couple days later. We got to 228, but this time, I think I said at the beginning of the game, I'm like, yeah, I'm not even going to really try playing in this game at all. I'm just going to sit back and just kind of go AFK for the majority of it or whatever. And I think I even did my taxes during this game too. Like I left for like six hours or straight or something like that. Didn't even play. I think the next weekend after I got 215, Rambo and Frenzy came back and they, they beat me. I, I wanted to play again, but I didn't really have the motivation to play immediately. And then uh, it just never really happened. But I mean, you know, there's still an opportunity to play one day. Like I, I want to have the record. I like guess something I've always wanted to have. There was really no competition for me at the time. Uh, there was a certain level of difference among players like myself when compared to old and newer DOA2 players who didn't have much, if any, experience from DOA1. Swado, the DOA2 legend, eh? Swado's, you know, always had some groundbreaking moments uh, that have been fun to watch. Swado is a monster in DOA2. Siempre le he tenido mucho respeto como jugador y he aprendido mucho de él. Esa partida él me carrileó muy fuerte. Yo solo mataba monos. Swato was an interesting player that came up in DOA 2 who really put so much time into that game. I'm not sure who to really compare him to as a DOA 1 player, but he was, I mean, almost, I wouldn't say like a Mr. Beast, but <laughs> he, he, he put so much time into DOA 2 and had a lot of accomplishments as well. He's the example of a guy who would just grind and play solo all the time. And uh, eventually he got broke through and got uh, past 192 solo. And I think he still tries to play from time to time. Most PS4 players, Swado and Joseph Joestar and those type of players, play a game a lot. <laughs> Playing multiple 225 games, in my opinion, is uh, too much for someone like me to sit there for like four days. I just, I just can't believe the things that he can do. I see him stream still a lot. He's always trying to get as high as he can, flawless, and it's just insane the rounds that he can pull off without dying. I don't know if he's trying to prove like, hey, I'm the best player. It's kind of just like we see. Everybody sees that you're really good. I don't think you need to play these like crazy flawless games with all these high scores to prove anything to anybody. <laughs> oh God. I see, I, I knew you were gonna bring up that little guy. Swato, in my opinion, is the most interesting player to ever play DOA2 for just how much he plays and how much he cares about simple things like flawless and score where nobody really cares. He's a good player, man. I'm not going to hate on him. He's a good DAPS player. He, he deserves that. And the dude, like, continuously, like, posted in, like, messages and shit on PS4 saying he's the, the best DAPS player or whatnot. Like, I'm not going to disagree or agree with that. He, he's not, I'm not going to say he's a bad dude. I just, I don't have very good interactions with him. And he's he's been a very big hater on my, my streams. But he has way too much time on his hands. <laughs> Swallow is, uh, is one of uh, definitely the best players that... I played, I played with and no one for a while. He does take the game a little bit too serious. Maybe I, I go restart for 300. Being number one in Silverbacks was never a thing for me. It was more just trying to recruit more people into the community. You know, DOA is such a small community as it is. For me, in the beginning, you know, playing solo high rounds was all about trying to just get better at the game and not have to have somebody carry me. And uh, eventually I was able to carry people on my own, you know, to like 128 and a little bit beyond that. And, uh, you know, just stacking up those defeats. Once I started climbing up there and being on the first page, it was kind of a goal to climb higher and higher. Only to realize later that pretty nerdy being, uh, you know, number one in defeats, but not being on the top page for leaderboards. 
says a lot about my skill level, unfortunately. I had like at least uh, 170 monkey kills before the leaderboard got reset. I did have high rounds, high scores, but eventually, I, even when the, the rounds were reset, it gave me the opportunity to, to beat those rounds again and uh, potential to see how, if I can do better, you know, and I think it was a good a good thing that the leaderboard resets. It, it does not affect anything. Anybody that had a high round, he had the chance to get it again. And what was even better, this time, even if you lag out, your last round still registers on on the leaderboard so that was a that was a good ad it's not just like a commitment for like a gaming session it's a commitment for like a few days of gaming sessions which you don't know how you're gonna feel on those subsequent days sometimes one of my most fondest times was during the start when you you were able to play multiple games a day uh, of course it's different now because like people who are good at it like they're gonna play games that's like a few days long if you're sitting on your ass doing absolutely nothing all weekend long for 10 straight hours you probably should reevaluate yourself and and i didn't do that for a long time playing those long round multiple day games which just suck looking back on that i, I don't miss a lot of that takes so much out of you physically you know endless hours of time wasting Rambo would finish a DOA game, one of those games that goes on and on and on for you know, three or four days straight. And he'd tell me it made him miserable. And I'd say, well, why do you keep doing it to yourself? There's something about being one of the best at something. It's difficult to walk away from that. So when I see someone getting a record or accomplishing something impressive while I'm away from the game, that bothers me. So Rambo actually took a long break in DOA 2 and there was many months that went by where no one could get past the Chinatown post-patch, I guess it had been fourth time around. And there was a lot of players that tried and never really could. But I know that he has some uh, interestingly funny videos on YouTube. I actually do remember the video that I found really funny. The washed up one. Oh, he's washed up. Fatal's good. Rio's not really. Fucking Rambo is a little bit washed. He doesn't really know how too much stuff works right now. He hasn't played in forever. He's rusty. At the time, I thought Chinatown 4.0 was impossible. And eventually Rambo came out of the woods, just swooped up the record on this first game back. The round 231 world record game with Rambo and myself uh, was a pretty random occurrence, mainly because I thought we'd either lag out or just not even have time to play because it turned out I was busy during most of the game and I was pretty much AFK from playing for like the first two days. The purple ray gun is probably the most overpowered aspect by far on DOA. Uh, the gun never became weaker as the rounds progressed, and if you're skilled enough, you, you could hold the same ray gun for over an hour, even in some of the triple digit rounds. Yeah, not only is it just too easy because of purple ray guns, but the vortexes also just allow you to get your multipliers back so quickly, unlike on DOA 1. Uh, if you don't have ray gun, you don't do good rounds. What I don't like is having to rely on getting the ray gun and skulls. But I don't know, there's, there's something about it that just don't feel conventional in a way. Don't feel like the way it used to be in DOA 1 when you had to build yourself up. DOA 2 lacks the middle ground that DOA 1 had, I felt. The difficult arenas are way too difficult. The easy arenas are way too easy. For example, on DOA 2, on the round 21 to 24, it's the arena is tiny. And when you get to round 80, when you do the level again, you only can have like one person alive running around because the arena's too small. You know, look at Colosseum. That's a good map design for a solo game, not a four player. If it comes to like really high rounds, like you're spending a ton of time on a map that you can't play uh, multiple players very efficiently at all. You know, like the China map, it's, it's not very friendly for co-op play. Swato and Furious still hold the co-op. 2p record at 260, the highest round achieved in dead ops. Yeah, I get one record with Furio on 260, and after 192, I let him play, but he almost died one time, so I take, I take back the control, and uh, he sleep all game. <laughs> you could have a second controller hooked up to your console, basically doing nothing and just boosting off it, making the game way easier. When nobody play, I mean, if you boost game, uh, there is not much problem. If you want to beat 
260, you're pretty much gonna have to like switch off carrying each other. And I, I just wish DOA 2 wasn't like that. Like Swato got the 262 player. So it's kind of like if you really want to beat that round, you, you have to carry each other. You have to switch off. While there is no round limit on DOA 2, there is a time limit. Anywhere between 70 to 75 hours of in-game time, you'll get a server reset error message. So in order to get a record nowadays, you basically need to minimize downtime as much as possible, taking shorter sleep breaks and whatnot. For solo at least, the game pretty much maxes out at 4th China no matter what. I, I just don't ever see anybody passing that no matter what fate they have. Yeah, that's stupid. Chinatown 4-0 is only loot base, you know? Unless you are fit, uh, you die. You don't have regular. I, I got the top slot on the Xbox One solo leaderboard, playing to my highest round on solo 225. You know if you start up a game, you, you're gonna get to 225. It's just the challenge of, okay, am I gonna get lucky enough to be 225? 225 and 226 is practically the same thing. You got a ray gun for like half the round and you beat it, cool. So what, you got luckier. And I wanna say I, I like the challenge, but it's kinda just to a point to where it's it's like, ridiculous just beyond belief how difficult it can be you'd have to have extreme luck with your pulls on all four rounds i don't know if anybody could ever pull that off the game is just way too fast paced for humans to even function oh great a zombie running at fucking usain's bolts top speeds coming at me like out of the side door out of nowhere and i'm supposed to see that to actually like have reflexes to see that shit coming while a whole horde's coming this way and somehow make a great escape back no it's just not possible Another one bites the dust Another one bites the dust And another one gone And another one gone Another one bites the dust Hey, I'm gonna get you too Another one bites the dust Cuando se terminó la 225, no podía creérmelo. Han sido muchos intentos hasta poder conseguirlo. No es fácil, después de, man, de un, después de más de un año intentándolo, pero nunca me he rendido hasta conseguirlo. So the first time I did it was, I was not that lucky, and the second time, around 225, I came out with 10 lives, so that just shows you how much luck there is. It just comes down to luck, especially with any fate besides the feet. And even with the feet, you need to be really lucky unless you have literally 100% perfect movement and godlike drops. Pistan, yeah, I, I played with him too. He's, uh, he's a good player. He would just grind and grind consistently, and he got better so fast. It's been such a long time since I've talked to him, but I used to be friends with him before he was uh, in the DOA scene. He was just grinding out jobs. Obviously, I could talk about players for a long time. You don't want me to talk about that. You want some other people like zombie prophecy. <laughs> So Finisher Jr. posted a screenshot, I believe on Twitter, claiming that he got the new solo world record at round 260. I thought a lot of people would call me a hacker and shit. You know, a lot of people said the same shit on Dead Ops 1, man. I had the, the highest score on uh, DOA 1, and I lagged out like 1 116 was like the highest score. I only died like, I think twice within the whole game. And uh, fucking everyone's calling me a hacker, man. It's, it's kind of the same shit when I posted that, you know, it's whatever. I mean, I, I, I don't know if y'all fucking have ever seen a hacker, on, like, let alone in fucking dead ops. The fun fact is uh, after his game, he's streaming and he died on 150 solo. The reason I think it's not legit is because he had no proof whatsoever, did it on local, and didn't even show the tabs were, you know, if he had deaths, he didn't show what fate he had, he could have had feet, gem, no fate, for all we know. And on top of that, his score was outrageously high for how much a good score player would have at that round. If you did it on PC, you could easily mod. Yeah, I don't know, there ain't much really to say about it. It is what it is. If you don't believe it, that sucks, man, you know? <laughs> but it's really all about luck, man. Try and get through that, that uh, with a four Chinatown. I am hoping that Black Ops 4 does have a DOA 3. I think it would be, that would be so awesome. If it happened, I would be over the moon. Estoy deseando que salga a DOA 3, pero aún no sabemos si saldrá. In DOA 3, what I would like to see is a bigger community, for one thing. I just would like to see the game take off a little bit more. New players are really, really important for games like this. Otherwise, the games just die out. 
for a DOA 3 game to be created, I would be excited. I would hope that it wouldn't be so far changed that it wouldn't really resemble the the original game at all. If there isn't a Dead Ops mode in Black Ops 4, I'm going to be pretty upset. Let's just say that right now. I'm really looking forward to it. The, the thing that just hyped me uh, to the max is uh, Dead Ops Arcade 3. I, I don't care about Blundell. I don't care about any other thing <laughs> within Black Ops 4. I just care about Dead Ops Arcade 3. Yes, yes, of course. I'm looking forward to uh, potential Dead Ops Arcade 3, but we'll see if it actually happens. Balance out the luck factor and the arenas in the game and the weapons. If there is such a thing as a DOA 3, I'd like to see it go right back to the basics. In regards to DOA 3, I want to see more consistency with the difficulty of maps, but not have them be so unreasonably difficult like Chinatown. I don't know, maybe maybe make it so that we, we can't go as far, because like 200 plus rounds, that's a long, long game, you know what I'm saying? Make it more accessible on the home screen so it's not some secret that nobody knows about that they stumble upon by accident. Although I don't think they necessarily need to build on the story or do anything from that aspect, it would be good to maybe see more hidden areas, maybe even hidden power. There's so much you could really do with DOA, and I, I trust Dave, whatever he does, if he does do it, it will make it fun and new and exciting. So I think one thing that would really help a third version would be that if you could allow for a permanent point of view change to overhead or first person, and not limit it to when you just get a power up. Uh, Cause you know, let's face it, a lot of people are playing the game, you know, purely for either the top down mode or they would prefer a more traditional view with the first person mode. It's ridiculous that people would ever want a permanent first person that's not really Dead Ops Arcade. I would give it probably like a 40% chance. There's a lot of doubt for me. I think it's like a 40% chance that they're actually gonna make it. As of now, I think I, I'd say like 50-50, like a 50-50 chance of it actually happening. I feel like they're focusing on other things like the blackout mode, obviously. I don't know. There's going to be the battle royale thing. They're getting rid of the campaign. I'm not expecting it, but I, deep down, I really hope that it happens. I think uh, it's probably going to happen. I think the chance is a lot higher than the chance that we expect the DOA 2 to come up from DOA 1, uh, I think, anyway. It's never been, like, extremely popular, uh, so it's not, like, a priority uh, type thing. I do think it's pretty good and possible there could be the DOA trilogy dream. I doubt it will ever happen. The chances that it might happen, they're, like, around 20%. I think the likelihood of uh, a DOA 3 being in Black Ops 4 is probably around 5 to 10%. It looks like there won't be much time for Dave King to even develop a uh, DOA 3. I don't believe they are gonna make a DOA 3. I want them to try to create new fates and I think it would be difficult because I, I can't think of any ideas for new fates. Definitely uh, switch up the fates a little bit. A third room of fate or a third like room of judgment. You can upgrade your fates like two times instead of just once. I mean, I would obviously love to see a DOA 3. I think it would be awesome just to see, like, who comes back for the community. I, I would like to think that I would play it. I just don't know when I would get around to it. That's the only problem. Uh, considering how much time I, I spent playing the first and second versions of the game combined, yeah, well, let's just say that I would absolutely look forward to it. I'm not going to say there's no chance that there will be a DOA 3. Personally, my opinion is if there was to be one, it would be in Black Ops five i guess whatever that would be if doa3 doesn't happen in black ops 4 it could always come back down the line in 2021 or even later right but you know eventually it has to come to an end like a doa4 or 5 seems kind of far-fetched or maybe it's just done forever and i think a lot of us are willing to accept that and appreciate the experiences we've had on both doa1 and 2 uh, again who really knows what will happen but i think there's always that possibility and hope uh, after all, the, the Silverback does have many brothers. Um, the one question I do get asked all the time on Twitter is, uh, is there going to be a Dead Ops Arcade 3? And I don't know, I've got some great design ideas. <laughs>